Hello ladies and gentlemen, I am Panchasso and welcome to Endless Legend, a game that has now officially been released and exited the Early Access Steam program, which is a remarkable achievement if I may say so, something that unfortunately many titles do not seem to be able to do or to do correctly. Thankfully, Endless Legend is everything but that. It's a game that benefited from the early access program, at least in my opinion, and right now stands strong as a fully released title, for which I'm actually kind of proud. I'm proud that the developers were able to do this, because I like the developers a great deal. Now, in case you do not know what my channel is, or what this game is, I need to clarify that if you have no idea what this game is, you probably should watch my Introducing Endless Legend videocast. The link will be in the description of this videocast. It's a video where I explain exactly what Endless Legend is, what a 4X games, what 4X games in general are, what are the principles behind them. So if you do not know what this game is, or what a 4X game is, which is the type of game, that we are about to play, then I encourage you to watch this other video cast, not this one. This video cast is made for people that already have some basic knowledge of the game, which I provide in the video, which again I linked in the description. Also, just for pure clarification, I am... I guess I could call myself a friend of the developers, since we do chat with each other on Steam and whatnot, and they have invited me to Paris in the past as well, so keep in mind that all of my opinions are biased. However, this videocast is not a review, is not anything of the sort. This videocast is the first video of a playthrough slash tutorial. I call it a playthrough slash tutorial because it is my goal to not only play through a complete session of the game, but also teach you all of my tricks as we move along. I am a fairly competent Endless Legend player, and I think I can safely say it, because I am able to, with relative ease, although not complete ease, I'll be honest, beat AI on Endless difficulty almost all the time. There is one exception to that which I am not talking about, but I'm pretty good. In multiplayer, probably a little bit less so, possibly because I take it less seriously, and possibly because I'm not as good against humans, or just not as good in general. But again, when it comes to theoretical knowledge of the game, I do have some of it, and I want to share it with you. So please stay tuned for that. What am I going to play, and what, who am I going to play as? Well, those of you who are following my channel are probably fully aware of who would I want to pick. It's the Cultists, the last faction which I am yet to feature on my channel. Actually, I never featured the Draken, did I? But the Cultists are the big deal. I mentioned already that I want to make a videocast for those guys, a, play a full playthrough rather than just a single videocast, since they are new, you have not seen them before, they are just added for this release, ver release version of the game only, and they are unique. And very strange, it's difficult to call them a difficult faction to play as, or an easy faction to play as. I call them a relaxing faction to play as because they can only ever have one city, and as such you have way less macro management than you normally would. So it's a very relaxing game when you play as the cultists, though I wouldn't call it necessarily easy. The interesting thing about the cultists is that they are very very powerful if somebody lets them build up for a certain amount of time. If they stand next to another player, they usually tend to die very very quickly if the other player is in any way competent. If they are given some time, they can go rampaging and spiral way out of control for anybody to stop them, really. So for this reason alone, Codus are a pretty interesting faction. Also, just, for, uh, just to clarify this for those of you who are not aware, they are a faction that was originally added uh, it's a, as a part of a community project. It's a faction designed not really by the developers themselves, although obviously they have done the majority of the work on them, but the idea of the codes comes from uh, one of the community members, Nosferatio, who I personally also know because he happens to be a VIP along with me. So yeah, we know each other. I was also in the competition. I didn't win. Almost! I almost made it to the second part, but I didn't. I would like my faction to be in the game more than Cortis, obviously, because I'm biased, but I have to be entirely honest with you. Cortis, on their own, are a pretty cool, innovative and interesting faction, way more than I originally thought or anticipated. For which I guess I can be thankful, because at the very least, even if I cannot play as my dream faction in this game, I can still enjoy a faction that is otherwise pretty cool and competent at everything it does. 
Now, what I'm going to do is a, uh, I'm going to set up an 8 player game, which means that it's going to be fairly big and it will take a while to complete. However, I am going to play as the cultists, and the cultists are pretty good at eradicating enemies. When you go into their main victory tab, it says supremacy, and there is a good supremacy, and there is a good reason for that. You can only ever have one city as the cultists. However, when you capture the enemy city, you immediately raise it. It's not like when other factors capture enemy city and then they have to wait forever if they do want to raise a newly conquered city. You raise cities for free and instantly. This also applies to enemy capitals. So all you have to do as the coders is find out where the enemy capitals are, snipe them all and win the game. It's actually a fairly interesting way to play, although it might take a while, but I am going to play with settings that are going to accelerate the process. Firstly, obviously the difficulty is going to be endless. The highest, because I like a challenge and I know that you are here to possibly learn or possibly watch me fail. Hopefully learn though, I think learning is cooler than failing, at least in my opinion. Game speed is obviously going to be fast, because that's how I play Forex games. Always. I just like it to be a bit more fast paced than slow paced. Battle Scape Factory is also going to be very fast. I learned my lesson when I'm making video casts. It is much, much better the idea to actually have your battles go through as quickly as possible so that you do not uh, st be st so that I'm not stuck forever on just a single battle screen. When it comes to world map summary, I am mostly going to play with the settings that you have already seen in the past. I'm going to go for mostly random setup, with the number of continents being random between 1 to 3, and most other things being basically random. So, I'm actually going to go for both hemispheres, because I like to know how the world looks like. And, I'll be honest, when I play by myself, I often go for random, because it's actually kind of cool to be playing on northern or southern hemisphere, instead of a like, normal world simulation. But this map is going to be so big, with so many players, it could be a little bit confusing, so having the both setting will allow us to actually know where we are and what we are doing. Most other things are random. Again, I, even though I do enjoy a high difficulty curve, I do leave anomaly odds on normal instead of rare, because, or rather few, because anomalies look beautiful and they are the spirit of this game for me. As for minor faction difficulty, Nomo is honestly what I consider to be pretty good. When you put it on hard, the enemy minor faction units start spawning very quickly, and although the challenge is enjoyable for me, it also tends to slow the game down quite considerably, and I do not want this to happen. As such, I'm going to leave minor faction difficulty on normal and start the game with those settings. I'll pause the recording as the map generates, and I'll be right back. Alright, we are now officially in the game and we can start talking about conquest and victory. I have decided to skip the introducing cutscene because for whatever reason the frame rate is very low during the cutscene, but you can watch it on YouTube if you do not own Endless Legend for yourself, which honestly you should, but that's entirely up to you and your decision. So what do we do first as the necrophage, I'm not a necrophage, what, what am I talking about? As the cultists is the exact same thing you would be doing as any other faction in the game. You select one of your scouts, in this case it's a preacher type of unit, and you explore the area around to see where you can settle most optimally. So I'm going to go ahead and move over like in this general direction, see what I can see, hopefully try to stay on the high ground so I can see a bit more. Alright, so it looks like the starting area for us is not too bad, not too great. There are plenty of anomalies, which is a pretty great thing, I have to admit. But the overall Fitzy value is not that great. There's a lot of food, however, which makes me rather happy. Not too much industry aside from this forest, and I'm probably going to settle more or less like here in this as a result, because this area gives me access to a bit of industry. Not a lot of science. I'll be unfortunately fairly behind in terms of science for the first few or at a several turns, and I'll probably be forced to expand more or less in this general direction as well, just to grab a little bit more science. This area would give me access to a lot of Fitzy, but not science, which makes me a little bit worried. So let's send another preacher out, which is something I'm not particularly fond of doing. What I really like to do is send one preacher out, and if I see a good location for a city, I just settle, so then I have a hero in the same army as uh, my second scout. However, we are playing as the necro not necrophages, what am I saying? Cultists! We are playing as the cultists of the eternal end. And you can only ever have one city as the cultists. You can never move it, you can never do anything. If you lose your city, you're gone for the game and that's it. So we have to make absolutely sure that we are in the best possible spot. 
As such, I'm willing to go ahead and split the army yet again and scout a little bit more. Maybe there's a better location nearby that I'm just not aware of yet, but it doesn't seem to be the case. If I settle somewhere over here, I lose access to a lot of those anomalies, and anomalies are very nice to have. At the same time, I really, really do need to have a little bit of science, because if I don't have it, it's pretty bad. Also, I'm really curious what kind of minor faction this is. I mean, those walls, those could be many numerous minor factions. This could be Sisters of Mercy, which would be pretty bad. All those could be Haunts. All those could be Seratan. No, not Seratan. Delvers. Plenty of possibilities. I don't know which faction it is. It's hard to guess it. So, let's think about this region. Do I want to settle here, or do I want to risk it and try to look for another region where I could actually settle my army? Honestly, I do not want to stay too far behind by moving my army to yet another region. As you can see, I'm directly in the re middle of this region. Moving to the neighboring ones would take forever, and I have no guarantee that they would be any good. So, even if this minor faction is not the best, even though I do not have any happiness providing anomalies, this area gives me a lot of food, a lot of dust, and a decent amount of production. I will have some problems with science, but thankfully, as at Cortis, I'll be able to remedy that in the middle of the game. So I just have to stay alive until then. Sounds decent enough, let's try it. So first things first, I do want to discover those ruins to get a bit more experience with my hero. And within five turns, I have to go to those ruins over there. Alright, that's achievable, I guess. It doesn't even have to be my hero that's supposed to go there. Also another hero that is, uh, makes it a good idea to settle in this region. I would have access to Blast Steel, so I already know that there is some sort of resource I can have over here. It's extraordinarily important for the Cortus, because keep in mind, again, you're only ever going to have one region under your control, so it's very important that this region has some sort of resources that you can harvest. Otherwise, you will be very bad when it comes to, you know, exchanging anything on the marketplace. You'll be forced to buy everything all the time, which is not exactly ideal. Anyway, I think this spot in particular is most optimal for me. It gives me some science, a ton of food, and makes it possible for me to create a very nice triangle, like so-ish. Yeah, that's a nice triangle. I would gain some extra science later on, and I would gain access to this anomaly. And then I could expand this triangle to go more or less in this direction as well. I like it. Alternatively, I could set over here for extra science, but I would have only two industry generation, as opposed to 5 industry generation, and industry is pretty important, so I'm just going to settle over here and see how it's going to go. I think it's gonna be fine though. So, our first city is settled, that's very nice. Our hero is now partially useless, he's basically yet another army that we have to pay for, because keep in mind, you pay for every army that you have, which is not exactly ideal. So what I want to do is unassign this hero and reassign him to another area that I can put him in. Now, for the Cortis heroes, what is very important is to have them as governors. In fact, if you play as any faction, even if you do not play as Cortists, if you have a chance, try to buy a Cortis hero on the marketplace, because they're really, really good at what they do. Firstly, have a look at this ability. Yeah, it's pretty impressive, isn't it? A level 3, it means that all of your Fitzy Generation necessity can be significantly increased, and you can choose what you want to increase by just moving your population around. Very, very impressive ability, very powerful one. It's fitting for the Cortis, because they can only ever have one city. However, if you get a Cortis here as another faction, oh, this is actually very scary. I don't want to use the scary word overpowered, but it is somewhere on the back of my head, if I have to be honest. What are your other abilities as the Cortis hero? Well, nothing is as impressive as this, this one, but there are some other fairly interesting ideas that you can go for. As you can see, there are plenty of ways of making your army more powerful, but there are also plenty of ways of making your city more powerful. You will need all of those four abilities if you are going to have a governor as Cortis, and you do certainly need one. The cool thing is, you are also going to get extra influence bonus from your hero, and you will need a lot of influence for reasons that I'm going to explain later. Yes, this guy is an okay general, he gives your army health boost, which is nice, but you desperately need him to be your governor. However, because I want to scout around a little bit, and exploring ruins gives you extra experience for your hero, I do want to assign this guy to an army first, because right now he doesn't have any abilities anyway, and even if I put him in a city, what will again? I will gain influence boost, I guess, which would be useful, but nothing more than that. So, let's just focus on this city. What should you do first? 
I experimented a ton before recording this video cast. Actually, for this entire morning today, I just sat down and I restarted a game as uh, the courtist over and over and over and over again on different maps just to see what build order suits them the most. I have found two that are almost identical in the end results and I want to share them with you. So, I have to admit, usually I would not gain as much as nice of a starting stat like this. This has a ton of food production and we're probably going to gain, yeah, another population point regardless of where I put my population. Which is pretty good, but let's assume you have start in a region with less generation of fits in general, that you do not have as much food or production or anything really. What do you do usually? Well, there are two options. You can either A. Go for Founders Memorial, put your population on industry, keep this population on industry for the entirety of time. In research, go for the Holy Trinity as always, which is Mill Foundry, Seed Storage and Public Library. I see no reason whatsoever why you should deviate from this Holy Trinity pretty much ever, especially as courtists. You really do need all those structures. So, once Mill Foundry is re done researching, you put it on the queue and you start going for it as well. So, as I said, there are two possibilities. Either leave your population on the industry production and keep it in here for all eternity until you are done creating both Founders Memorial and the Mill Foundry. Alternatively, you can put your population on food production if you need to. I don't at the moment because it won't change anything, but usually you don't have this much food production. So, let's say you have less food production and you wouldn't gain one population in one turn. So, in this case, you can put your population on food production. Wait until you have two citizens and once you have two citizens, you can put both of them into industry production and then continue with your Founders Memorial into Mill Foundry queue. And that's a phone call, I'm sorry for that, I didn't mute my phone. Anyway, yes, I am ignoring it, because I love you guys. So, unfortunately I also got distracted for crying out loud. Oh yeah, I remember what I was saying. Both of those, those build orders, generally speaking, provide you with the same results. More or less at the same time, you're going to have both free units of population, Fundinus Memorial, Mill Foundry, and probably be on your way of having a seed storage as well. Of course, the results vary depending on how much industry, science, and food generation you have around your city. But generally speaking, if you go only for industry, or if you wait for two population and then go for industry production, usually you gain similar results. My personal recommendation, always try to get second population or second worker as soon as possible, because then you ha just have more flexibility and you can assign your population to other areas whenever necessary. Once you have two of them, always focus on industry and gaining Founders Memorial and Mill Foundry as quickly as possible. Now, this might be actually a little bit different in our situation, however, purely because I have very, very little science production. Five turns until Mill Foundry? Ugh, that's pretty bad if I have to be entirely honest with you. And I'm going to gain Founders Memorial way before that. So what probably I'm going to do is put some of the population into science production so I can gain Mill Foundry at the same time as I finish building Founders Memorial. Alright, so there is done. That's our first turn gone. It did take us some time, I know, but it's always the case when I start a new series. I do need to explain what is the ideology behind my build order because I believe it's very important to explain this kind of thing. Now, there's the law, so you can go ahead and read it out. If you want to, you just have to pause the video cast. I encourage you to do so because the law is awesome, as, always it is, as it always is in Endless Legend. But we are not going to focus on that. We are purely and only going to focus with our objectives. Right now we are going to be given some extra wine, which is a decent improvement, luxury resource, but not the best for the courtists, unfortunately. Still, I'm not going to complain. And what I have to do is convert two minor faction villages into the court. Now, you may be asking, what does it mean to convert minor faction villages? It's actually very simple. Firstly, what is this? Fuck! Crying aloud. <sighs> Why did I have to get those? Whatever. So, again, Sisters of Mercy in my studying region, which is probably the last thing I wanted. But that's okay. Let's ignore that for the time being. So what I w because fortunately I have ways of getting around this. And my mouse is lagging for some reason. So, I have discovered a new minor faction. Once I talk to them and pacify them, I do not have to talk to them. I can conquer them, I can bribe them, 
because as Cortis, I do start with the ability to gain language square. Either way, once I pacify them via any means necessary, I will have another ability. I will have the ability to additionally convert them to my faith or belief or culture or whatever we want to call it. Once a pacified village is converted, it is considered a part of your empire regardless of the area where this village is. It can be in my region, it can be in any other region, it doesn't matter. This village and all the tiles adjacent to it will be forever, I mean not forever, but from this point forward considered to be mine. Those tiles will give me extra fitzy values in my primary city and those villages will also act as villages that are within my region and they will give me all the benefits within. So I'll gain benefits like for example extra assimilation effects, I'll be able to make those units, well not exactly, I'll be given those units for free, manufacturing units that is, and in general I'll be also able to assimilate them and so on and so forth. You'll see that in action not too uh, very quickly from now on. However, there is an additional cost. Firstly, you need to pacify the enemy village, which sometimes can be a challenge in and on itself. But secondly, which is sometimes more important, after pacifying, if you want to convert the enemy village, you also have to pay a pretty hefty amount of influence. And generating a lot of influence with just one city can sometimes be pretty tricky, and you can struggle a bit to actually achieve so uh, achieve this. However, fear not, for I'm going to focus on being able to bypass this and assimilate as many villages as possible. Which is, by the way, the way you win as the courtists. You need to have as many villages converted into your faith, culture, whatever, as quickly as possible, because then you can spiral out of control. Because once a village is converted, it can be uh, unconverted, would be the word, I guess, by other factions. They can basically burn the village down and then you have to reconvert them all over again if you want them to be your servants. So, something I did not mention. What do you do when you have a lot of dust income, which like I currently actually do. Do you buy out structures when you can? Generally the answer for that is yes, but because I can see that I will gain Founders Memorial very quickly and I will not have the Mill Foundry very quickly, I want to make sure that I... you know what? Yes, I will buy out the Founders Memorial. It's fairly cheap, I still will have mo most of my treasury intact and I certainly do want to gain Mill Foundry as, well, as quickly as possible. And the Founders Memorial, finished quickly, gives me a lot of extra benefits, including extra influence, which is very important, as well as extra science, which is again extra important for me, as I have very little science duration on my own. So in 110, I'm now going to have both Founders Memorial, access to Mill Foundry, and I'll be on my way to gaining another period of population. Fairly nice for a 10 too, isn't it? Yes it is, but let's not be too ecstatic yet. AI is playing on endless difficulty, they are cheating like crazy and they will get ahead of us pretty quickly, so we need to act fast and we need to act furiously. So first thing, let's furiously talk to those innocent civilians. What do they want? 10 glass steel, that's very expensive. I'd much rather bribe them with money, or rather dust, then bring them the 10 glass steel because this is way too much. Thankfully, I do have glass steel generation in my region, but those girls are not worth 10 glass steel, so I'm just going to bribe them with dust when I have enough of it. Actually, do I have enough of it? 118. I almost do. I don't really want to spend this much dust on them, though. They're not worth it. Not even close to it. Alright, Eric is nearby. That's good. They are much better minor faction than Sisters of Mercy for the cultists. They provide you with pretty nice units, pretty nice bonus. They're not going to be the guys that I'll assimilate most likely, but... Seriously? Alright, they do not want to negotiate with me, that's fairly annoying. They do not want to give me any sort of quest. This usually means that there's another quest that interferes with the quest that they would possibly give me. As such, if I wait, I might be gain access to talk to them again. But I so hate it when people just don't want to talk to me. Especially when I'm cool this because this is literally the most important thing for me to do. Talk to other minor factions and assimilate them. Alright. As you can see, it makes no difference if I put one population in food production or if I put both of them in industry production. As such, it is a much smarter idea to put one of them in food production so I can gain extra uh, population in 110 and still have Mio Foundry done in free turns. And in fact, because I'll gain extra population, it might be even faster than that. Alright, let's keep on moving, scudding along if possible, and do whatever else I can. 
you the assess. <sighs> I think I might actually just ban this village down. I mean, by fulfilling the quest, I only gain classification, which is not really a big deal. I might end up moving my hero around, like, over here, and then ban the village down. They are not worth my trouble, they are not worth my money, and they are certainly not worth my glass steel. So I'm not going to give it to them. As simple as that. I can be a mean person, and cultists, law wise and uh, gameplay what not. No, no, no. Only law wise are probably the most evil faction in the game right now. I'm not saying that gameplay wise they are, because honestly, gameplay wise, the most evil faction in the game are by far the roving class. And I don't think you can really argue with that. I have proven <laughs> that nothing is more evil than the roving class. I think I have. So anyway, let's go ahead and continue exploring. Try to get to those ruins in time. Will I be able to make it? Relic of the past. Uh, two tens. Uh, no, I will not be able to make it. That's fairly annoying. Let's keep moving in this general direction anyway, because at the very least, I'll just scout out what is inside those ruins. So this will be something. I can speed up the construction of Mill Foundry for 65. That's not very expensive, and this would put me a little bit ahead. It's only one extra 10 that I save, however this extra 10 could be fairly important when it comes to catching up with the AI and I do not have anything else that I desperately need to pay for or rather buy out. So I'm just going to move all my population to SAS production, get Mill Foundry in 110 and work on Siege Challenge on the next 10. So far so good, our city is growing fairly quickly. But I bet that if I were to go into status screen yeah, as you can see, the enemy is ahead of me in terms of score. That is to be expected, we are playing against endless level AI. They always will be ahead of you in terms of score until you start being aggressive or focusing on some of your other strengths or start trading, whatever. You need to start doing something before you can even think about being better than the AI. Now, another problem, uh, problem that you'll face is that AI on endless always have a very straight curve on the reset screen. They always gain tech at the exact same pace, no matter what. They always have this curve. I mean, sometimes I've seen very small deviations, but for the most time, for the most part, you'll never be able to catch up to the AI in this of tech until, uh, like, era 5, I would say. Maybe era 4, if you really put your strength into science production. Because until era 5 or 4, you just won't be physically capable of get generating as much science as AI most of the time. There are exceptions, but there aren't too many exceptions. Alright, comparing myself to Draken, I can say for a fact that I'm not doing too hot yet, but things can change yet. We just started playing the game and I'm feeling moderately confident, although I certainly need to start assimilating minor factions as quickly as possible. Also, the Drakens are right next to me, which is not necessarily the best thing ever, but then again, they are diplomats, maybe they will not try to kill me too quickly. And if they do, I will actually try to kill them even faster than that. Alright, so let's make sure that I do gain access to seed storage as quickly as possible, but also grow more population as quickly as possible, while maintaining my influence generation, which will also be fairly important. So, I like this kind of population separation because it gives me extra population fairly quickly, seed storage as fast as it possibly can be, and extra influence which I really 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 do need if I want to start converting enemy factions, minor factions that is, and I certainly do. Diddly do. Sorry, I just felt like rhyming right there. So let's go ahead and finish the stand and I'll take a very very quick sip of water, so excuse me for a moment. Hmm. That's nice. Water is the best. I have failed a quest. Oh well. I would have uh, been given a rather reward, which would actually be fairly decent. However, regardless, it was very hard for me to complete this quest. And I gained 10 gold anyway, which is actually going to be moderately useful. And again, luxuries tend to be less useful for you than other factions because they only benefit a single city. As such, the effect on the whole empire is limited when you compare it to effect on other factions. Of course, you could argue that you have to pay less for activating those re resources, but in general, the truth of the matter is that you do not need to care about those resources as much as you usually do when you're playing as other factions. Alright, what do I want to do? Do I want to start killing people? Uh, yes, I actually do. I actually do. What I'm going to do is move this guy over here. With a hero on level 2 and 2 preachers, I could be able... Eric is a pretty tough arm though. 
I don't think I dare to do it. Instead, I'm going to start moving in this general direction and try to conquer Sisters of Mercy, who are much, much weaker. I think I like this idea. Maybe I'll be able to gain a quest from those guys, though, so let's just, quick, just quickly check this on the next turn. Anything else I need to do? Well, my city is doing the production quite nicely. So, can I get... Oh, yes, I do need to gain extra science, so I'm going to do just that. Do you want to start making some more military units? It's about time, but I do want to make a public library first. However, I might as well edit the preacher already. So what do you like to put on preachers? Those are the units that I want to keep far away from the combat. They can give very powerful buffs to the rest of your army, as you can see. This is nothing that you can complain against. And they also actually deal a decent amount of damage. Yes, they do have low damage. But low damage actually, at least in the current version of the game, it might change soon. It Instead of lowering your damage, it lowers your attack, which means that this unit is very unlikely to hit the enemy. Or hit the enemy well. You're most likely going to get partial hits or just flat out misses when you try to attack anybody with this guy. However, when you do hit somebody, you do, you do deal some damage. 18 damage is not that bad. But again, you're probably going to only deal 50% of this or just 0% of this. So you keep that in mind. How do I like to specify uh, to create my preachers? Depends on what kind of units I have already assimilated. However, because most of the time they stay in the back, I just tend to give them unsteady ability. Because unsteady can be used against enemy units quite efficiently, and you do not need to have extra defense value on your preachers. They already have quite a lot of defense, and they usually stay in the back regardless. This thing gives you a very nice ability, as steady can mess, up, mess with the enemy army a lot, and this increases your initiative by a ton. And being able to cast unleashed potential before anybody else does anything is invaluable, so I would highly encourage you to do so. Occasionally, I also go for the talisman for increased movement. It does help you move around the map, but that's pretty much about it. And I do like those guys to remain as cheap as possible, so I'm just going to apply those changes and finish the turn. And because this video cast is fairly lengthy already, I'm in mean 30 minutes with a bit of extra, I'm going to end it right here. Ladies and gentlemen, it was Pancha, so also known as the Mighty Mix Palmer. If you enjoyed this video cast, please do, by all means, stick with my channel and wait for the next part to come out, which will, should hopefully happen tomorrow. On average, I publish video cast... Uh, four times a week, I would say. So sometimes I publish them one day and then another day and then I have a break, it depends. But I almost always publish uh, publish full video cast each week. Either way, thank you very much for watching. And just before we end this video cast, you can now stop watching if you don't, don't care. I need to rename my city because it's a fairly important thing to do, isn't it? I mean, this, this is the only city we're gonna get. We have to name it in a fairly important manner. Now, I, uh, I kind of was tempted to put a name to the city again, as in give it a real life name. But since there is a faint possibility that some people I know who would make the correct connection might watch this video cast, as such, I'm not going to put a name in. Instead, I'm going to go for a more roundabout way. I'm going to name the city Warsaw, after a Polish capital. Now, why do I do that? Because... I was born in Warsaw? No, that's not the reason. The reason is actually fairly simple, it's because of my recent escapade to Korea, as a result of which I have a lot of friends that I miss from Korea, from Malaysia, as well as from Indonesia, Singapore, Japan and China, as well as some other parts of the world as well. All of those people are encouraged to visit Warsaw, so this is again a sign of encouragement. Seriously, go here and meet me for crying out loud, I miss you everybody. <sighs> but thankfully, there is one person that is actually indeed going to go from Malaysia and visit Warsaw. <laughs> and I'm really, 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 really excited about it. This is going to be awesome. Anyway, thank you very much for watching. That was a little bit of off-topic side note. If you were interested, probably you, you weren't. But either way, thank you for watching again, and I'll see you online.